Hello, Internet! Welcome to episode 277 of the Asota Calibers podcast. The second night of the podcast is a little bit for everyone. I'm Weird Beard. And tonight, we are having ourselves an ACP roundtable. Now, David mentioned, yeah, a roundtable after a uh, after a holiday is a, is a pretty good idea because we've all been running around. We have, maybe haven't had a chance to, to, to cook up a segment. But honestly speaking... Before even Thanksgiving, I just was telling everyone, yeah, I think we're going to be having a round table because the news has just piled up. So there's a ton of stories to talk about. And there's, there, you know, there we, we, got, we got a show already. But uh, without further ado, of course, she's here. You, you're you just waiting for me to stop talking to hear her. Erin Paulette. How are you doing, Erin? Ah. Uh... I don't want to bring the energy down. Uh, I, I have not had a really good weekend. You can read about it on my blog. That's all you need to know right now. How are you doing, Weird? I'm doing okay. It was, uh, it was, it was, uh, there was, there's a lot going on. I, I feel like we've been away for like a week. Like, I feel like it was like a week's vacation instead of just a long weekend. Uh, but, I mean, uh, it has been a week since we last recorded. Yeah, it, was lots, it has been a week since we last recorded, but. But I feel like yeah. But we usually do something on Thursday, and for some reason we didn't last week. I mean, I wasn't stopping you. <laughs> well, you weren't there. No, I was not. I, I was. I wasn't remotely awake. I had Thanksgiving dinner, and then immediately <laughs> just was like in a food coma. Oh, you, uh, which is normally not something that happens to me. But I think yeah, I, I was going to say amateur. I but I but I I think I have been staying up pretty pretty late as of recently. So yeah, like I just like <laughs> just like as soon as people were gone, I'm just like I'm going to bed. So your turkey wasn't made with extra tryptophan. I mean, so there's there is a lot you could read. There's multiple papers on whether or not the uh, the tryptophan in, tur- in in turkey meat has anything to do with why you are feeling sleepy, or it could just be that just a uh, just a heavy calorie calorie load. Your body goes, yeah, no, 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 we're we're, we're going to need all hands on deck to move this one through. It's, it's a also joke, tends to weird. Be very carb. It, yes, it is. It's a joke. You're overthinking okay. it. I'm sorry. I'm a biologist. I can't turn it off. But it's also the, the one of the popular theories now is that it's not the tryptophan, but the heavy carb load that you usually have with that meal. Yeah. Mythbusters did a segment on it. Yes, but they're not science. As the they've fuck repeatedly they said. I, I don't know. I think that they've got a lot more scientific rigor than a lot of things passing for science these days. Oh, I don't I, disagree. Yeah, no, they do. They 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 do a very very good job, but they also their primary job. Like, when I was working in a research lab, our primary job was to create like the most bulletproof scientific paper possible. Their that's that's their second. That's their like their second priority. Their first priority uh, is to I, produce. I would say their third priority. Yeah, is to but the first they're, they're definitely first, the first priority is for Jamie and Adam not to kill each other. <laughs> I mean. Second priority is to entertain the audience. Third priority <laughs> is not to let any of the interns die. Yes. And then fourth or fifth, I think, might have be something to do with scientific rigor. Mm-hmm. Maybe. All right. Well, that was the voice of David. How are you doing? David? Hello. Um, it's been a weekend. Um, yeah, you just Saturday don't want to admit that you're drowning in pussy right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a better. I was going to put it that way, but Aaron Paulette for the win. And I'm not being crass because David has two brand new kittens that he rescued from a cold, cruel death. He's trying to convince himself that he doesn't now have five cats. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Saturday morning was spent, as most of my Saturday mornings these days, uh, sitting guard outside the synagogue. And as as per usual, and as those who have heard the uh, the segments, uh, the other fellow who was there and I did make jokes about our whistles and noisemakers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then uh, Sunday night, last night from from here, from time of recording, we 
came home and uh, saw something outside and realized it was a couple of kittens, opened the kitchen door, and one of them just powered right across through the door, across the room, and right up to the cat food bowl and started eating. My wife took two steps outside the door, and the other one came right to her. So they are now ensconced in our guest bathroom until we can find someone else to take them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be calling rescue groups and such and foster groups tomorrow. I have some leads. And, uh, and we... it's not kitten season, so they shouldn't be full. And even though David deeply suspects that they are both females, I, I think they should be they should be named Horace Smith and Daniel Wesson. Well, you start taking your allergy pills, you're welcome to adopt them. Oh, I mean, allergy pills won't even won't even get the half of it. And how how can I adopt them if you're keeping them? Because I'm not keeping them. So uh, you, you all heard this on the air. <laughs> Find listeners of the Assorted Calibers podcast. We will hear the continuing stories of David not keeping the two full-grown cats. Hey, we've got a pretty good track record. Prior to this, we rescued seven feral kittens eight years ago and only kept three of them. <laughs> we are not keeping just less than half of the two kittens we rescued last night. That would be horrible. No. Yeah, you're going to keep them both. We understand that. No. Yeah. Just round up. To just both Horace them. Smith and Daniel Wesson. Do we get on with the show now? <laughs> <laughs> Oddball. <laughs> Save David from himself. Well, I mean, I, I was going to say that uh, David was a very good boy and didn't interrupt you at, at all while you were doing your introduction, so he should re reward himself with a couple of kittens. <laughs> That's I mean, I, that... You keep this up, I'll reward you with a couple of kittens. I mean, <laughs> David does really, really like cats, so... Don't you know, threaten more, him more with a good time. It's kind of like more guns. Right? No, more cats means less guns. Because cats ain't cheap. One of the great lies of the American culture is when you drive down the high, down a, a road and you see a sign that says free kittens. <laughs> I, there is something to be said of every time I go to PetSmart to, to buy the giant bag of cat food or kitty litter, mm -hmm. and I get up, get up to the front and there, there's the thing that says, would you like to uh, donate to uh, feed stray cats? Animals? Is it, no, I, I, I'm, I'm spending I, enough on. It. <laughs> I already do that. Or you take a cat to the, or cats to the vet, and you get the bill from the vet, and realize that's a handgun. I mean, sometimes, especially with with uh, some of my tastes, that that's two or three. Uh, it, it could be a six pack, <laughs> depending on the actual vet visit. <laughs> it's twelve or thirteen Cobra Derringers. <laughs> no, no, it would be, it'd be fewer than that. Maybe uh, eight or nine Altors. <laughs> Actually, Oddball, what is the least expensive trash panda gun that you've bought? Is Probably the Altor. The Altor. Uh, uh, are, are you talking about new or how much I paid for it? How much you paid for it? Um, I think I paid 60 bucks for that Intratec 32. Oh, or that, yes, that thing, and that that I advised you not to fire, and you said I didn't need that advice. <laughs> and for those playing at home, I, I didn't need that advice in that, so, yes, I, I agree with you. I Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of like the guy telling you not to carry the Ivor Johnson. It's like, oh, no, I'm quite aware. Because I, I have multiple guns that I've, that I've paid a hundred bucks for, <laughs> including that Ivor Johnson. Yeah, I mean, from a historical standpoint, the Intratech is a good purchase. Uh, yeah, it's it's historically interesting. Yes. Uh, however, a as an actual working firearm, it's a little frightening. Now, what is what is this one? I'm I, I did a quick search, and uh, I'm fine. Uh, the, the closest thing that I think I'm finding is a little two barrel double action Derringer. No, no, this is uh, what is it? The Intratech. P TP thirty two or something? Uh, I'd have to. I, I can, if you want, I can run and grab it and, and take a picture of it. Because yeah, I'm not quickly finding a picture of it. Or what? Or is it twenty five? I will. I found. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah it's it was a twenty five. Intratech twenty five. I found this. Yeah, that's that's it. Yep, and there and there Except it is in the finish that I have. Well. The finish that you're started with. 
Well, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> and, and it is just as high quality as you can expect, as as you would expect it to be. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, I've I've definitely like had said, some. It's interesting when you take it apart. Mm-hmm. I definitely had some guns just unloaded on me. Did, do you want this? Yeah. Wait, you're giving me a free gun. The answer is yes. The, 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 yeah. the answer. The answer is yes. Is it is it is it is it, is it a good gun? But no, no, you're giving me a gun. I'm not looking it in the mouth. Yeah. Well, you should never look a gun in the mouth. No. But that's how I got my Smith and Wesson Model Twenty Seven. Mm. I think I've told that story before. But speaking of stories, we should probably address some of the uh, stories in the what are, what I think are called show notes. Not that we use them. Yep. No. This. Uh... These uh the the fir- the first stories I've got, I've got listed is uh well it was I was I was posting them into the, in, into into the show notes as Aaron was sending them to me and I'm like oh yeah no I saw these is that last week we talked about how the Washington Post uh published uh uh some photos of uh of the uh of of victims of mass shootings specifically mass shootings from ar-15s in attempt to push propaganda against the ar-15 and uh and i actually i found all of these stories because i was actually while i was editing the show and hearing us talking about it i was just like i i really want to see like what i can see from this what what did they publish how much did they blur this out how grotesque were these photos and honestly speaking, I have I, I did a bunch of searching and I was actually not able to find the article, even though I found uh, a couple of Washington Post articles that were not paywalled. And uh, uh, and uh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, I found they're, the article they're walking it back. Well, that's that's the thing that I'm seeing is they're getting a lot of flack and a lot of people are calling them out for uh for being turds and 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 really being in poor taste of publishing this and uh um i think actually no i think they i they have the um they have the story up but the photographs are are either buried somewhere in behind a link and these articles are filled with these like crappy links that just go to that seem to be like ai generated uh but uh or algorithm generated but yeah they they have the story is there the i believe the story is the terror on repeat a rare look at the devastation caused by an ar-15 and it's in the the related links on uh on the uh, on on the articles in the uh in 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 the show notes i mean there's literally a link to the article in the first article that you link to in the show notes it's not difficult to find um i i read it and does they, it have the graphic images? Well, it has graphic images, um, but it's mostly blood and bullet holes and body bags. Um, uh, there so it's is not actually showing the injuries. So there is one article. Article. So there is one picture involving dead bodies, but it is of the Las Vegas shooting, and it is so far back that you can barely make out that they're bodies, at least to my ah. eyes. Um, you know, by context, you can figure out what's going on. But if you just looked at, well, uh, actually, you might be able to now that I see it again. But the thing is, it's zoomed out far enough that it's going to be pretty much impossible to figure out who is who. And that was, I think, the major concern that the families of the victims had, that their loved ones would be shown in a, in a state. And, and this, yeah. is, this is far back enough that, uh, I mean, it, it's, well, it doesn't bother me, but who knows? I might just be callous at this point. Um, I'm actually going to post it, but that's, that's the only picture involving dead bodies. Everything else was, you know, blood, bullet holes, or body bags, which is still fairly disturbing, but it's not actually, you know, what are you doing showing dead people? Right. But either way, the 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 big the big takeaway I got from these articles is, is that they weren't really getting a whole lot of positive feedback. I mean, they probably were getting some from, you know, their 
they're 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 handlers from the the various Bloomberg organizations, but uh, but they were uh, but they were getting a lot of pushback, and the pushback was both from you know pro Second Amendment people who were calling them out for being ghouls, but also from uh, from anti gun people like like uh Lori phillips the uh the 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 woman whose uh, daughter was killed in the aurora colorado uh shooting and who uh was part of the brady campaign and her and her her, uh her husband were uh uh were the the plaintiffs in the lawsuit against lucky gunner and there's all sorts of shenanigans that go on with that because essentially they declared bankruptcy but they're still doing just fine because of how they managed to get their assets squirreled away before they declared bankruptcy. And so the, uh, uh, she, but she was one of the people that was, 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 was calling them out for being ghoulish. And, and uh, that's, so that's definitely a, uh, a sign. Yeah. Yeah. No, another one was Fred Gutenberg, who of course I, I, I reviewed his crappy book <laughs> this, this summer. And so, yeah, they, this is one of those things of the, you know, maybe the hardcore anti-gun lobbyists were the ones that put them up to it. Cause again, this was not a, this doesn't, this, this does not strike me as an organic story. This, right. this strikes me as, because I, I doubt that, I mean, these photo, many of these photographs are from, you know, multiple different shootings. Some of them are years apart uh, from, from, from each other. And so the idea that they suddenly got like a bolus of these crime scene photos just on their doorstep and then had to decide what do we do with these or had they had them for a long period of time and were deciding on what to do with them and finally were talked into running a story with these, with, with these photographs. Right. Do you think overall, and this is a question for each of the members of the panel, um, but do you think overall this has hurt or helped the the anti-AR position? I'd call it a wash. Yeah. I don't I don't I don't think this movement I don't think this moved many needles. Just just like how um how the you know the, the shooting events don't really move anybody you know you have david hogg who was involved in the marjorie stoneman douglas you know she was he was there he, and he, there's debate i i i i'm he, going he said he rode to the school yes that's that is true i yeah no. that's i i don't want to get into that i don't want no, i don't want but anyway uh, but, i i but, think oh sorry go ahead but yeah but he he was he was a student there but i get the impression that his family was a, an anti-gun household and was right. not it was was in favor of gun bans to begin with um and then as opposed you, to kyle how do you pronounce his last name kishev kishev thank you yep who has the different opinion yeah correct it's it, been ignored by the media and his household yeah. And I mean, it's, I, I remember watching the news coverage. I was, you know, I was at my father-in-law's house when, when, when that shooting happened and they just, and the, the cameras were there and they were interviewing all the students and it was literally 50, 50 of the, you know, either, well, I guess, I guess it was, you know, the, the, uh, you know, you know, 33, 33 and 33% uh, of people that were either calling for more gun control saying that you know gun laws did did were you know have nothing to do with this or people saying that they had no opinion uh and they didn't want to, they didn't want to talk about it one way or the other uh and so i i don't i don't think these move anybody's needles i think i think the cements some some you know so, some some people i think i think this is going to move some people that are more pro gun a little bit more so just because of how ghoulish and just why, why would you do this? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I also, from things that I've heard through uh, friends and family on the left, that it's actually made some of them take a step back. Mm -hmm. How so? Because, uh, oh, basically 
how could they do that? That was horrible. That was ghoulish. I don't know if I want to be affiliated with that. Mm. So I think it moved the needle slightly in the pro-gun direction. Just because, like you said, weird, it made some pro-gun people a little bit more pro-gun, but it also caused some of the prohibitionists to back away a little bit, maybe become less involved, which which is effectively making them slightly more pro-gun by making them less anti-gun or less active anti-gun. But Aaron, what was your thoughts? What were your thoughts? Grammar. My thoughts were if I could accurately predict what the gun prohibitionists would do (laughs) and how they would react, I would be in a much more influential position right now. And very wealthy. Yes. But I'm going to say is what what is your gut saying about any effect that this has on the the overall assault on the AR15? I really didn't think it was going to change anything. Little to the pro little because okay. the people who are anti-gun they're just going to have their biases confirmed by this. I mean, I I'm not saying I'm not disagreeing with what you said about family members. I'm just honestly surprised. Yeah. I, with a couple of them, I was surprised as well. I thought they would lean into it and say, see, this is why there shouldn't be any AR-15s. Exactly. But but the uh, the idea of it basically dancing in the blood of victims that blatantly turned them off more than it reinforced their anti-gun biases. So that's why I think it didn't move it much, but it, it might have just ticked it a little bit towards the pro-gun side by turning off the some of the anti-gun support so this leaves this leaves oddball for the radical crank position there you go <laughs> uh, except i i'm with uh weird and aaron that that i don't think that this really changed uh much of anything for for anybody um but i, I mean I, th- I think david's david's got a good point on the i i, I think if anything, I don't think it moved the needle much, but I think if it did move the needle, I think it did move the needle a little bit more towards the Second Amendment side because, like I mentioned, there, like there's 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 been multiple like staunch anti-gun people. I mean, Sandy yeah. Phillips literally worked with the Brady campaign, got hung out to dry by the Brady campaign because they essentially got stuck with a bill and then put her family through bankruptcy all for something that either she, I mean, the fact that she's not outraged says to me that maybe she was told that this was an opportunity. This, this was a possibility from the get go because someone should have mentioned the, the, you know, the protection of lawful commerce and arms act. And the fact that right at the very beginning, yeah, the fact that she, she doesn't say nobody told us about this. We weren't expecting this and is still a staunch supporter of gun control and still speaks on behalf of the Brady campaign and, and other, and other anti-gun groups and all that. And she's a vocal, you know, dissenter against this, this, this article. I think if anything, it's like you said, David, at least walked some people back. Oh, Um, I think, I think the, the biggest thing this has done is this has, tarnish the reputation of the post uh with a lot of people that did that didn't already have a very tarnished thought i'm gonna say how how do you tarnish dog poo i but but there there are still a lot of people that that consider it a reputable uh publication and bless their hearts and, and most and of the, most, most of those people are in nursing homes that are too sick sick to change the channel on their tv well that that's fair that's a possibility but woof. well now m- moving on i actually found this news story and I, I this was this was one of those ones of the i read the headline and totally thought it was something completely different and then read the article and was like oh this is interesting and went through and so aaron have you heard of the one pulse foundation yes i live in florida Okay, and so the the, the headline is One uh, Pulse announced the foundation will be dissolved. Uh, I will say that I had heard of One Pulse for America, which is the the George Takei and uh, formerly Lad Everett 
uh, group, anti-gun group that really didn't do anything. Like I was on high alert and searching so much when this group was launched. And I knew that, that lad Everett, who is a, an extremely bad actor in the anti-gun uh, gun group was, was essentially the, you know, the, the, the operating officer uh, for it that I was expecting them to really be pulling some, some dastardly stuff. And as far as I know, they didn't do anything except for like a couple of press releases and a few like small, small, like interviews. Well, um, I, I went to their website and their webpage is very, very pretty, but that's all it is. Uh, they haven't said anything worthwhile since 2020 and they haven't said anything at all since 22. So despite whatever publicity they got from George Takei headlining it and whatever support they got from Lad Everett or Bloomberg or whatever, uh, my tiny org, Operation Blazing Sword, has actually done more in the past three years than this big mega org has done in terms of helping people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm or, or proud really of that. Of, of anything at all. But yeah. but again, this this one pulse group is not one pulse for America. This yeah. is an entirely different group. Mhm. Mm yeah, uh, and this was all about turning the Pulse nightclub into a memorial for the 49 people that were murdered there. And that's good and fine, but uh, okay, I I haven't been following it because I've been dealing with, you know, trying to run my own org. And the, I don't know all the details. I imagine that a large part of it was, well, it's a crime scene, and that needs to be first released by the police and then cleaned up, and there's probably some insurance claims, and I don't know how long that takes. But I do know that it's been seven and a half years at this point since Pulse, and you know, even factoring in the COVID lockdown, I mean, I, I don't know real estate. Maybe it does take this long, but it seems like seven and a half years is plenty of time in order to acquire the property to turn it into a museum, especially since they had received over a million dollars of money, well, so, some, of, some of which from like the state of Florida. And so I, I I don't know what's going on, but what I'm saying is if they couldn't get it done within the first few, you know, th three, four years before COVID, yeah, it wasn't going to happen. And especially when you uh, take into account the fact that apparently the owner of the property was one of the founding board members. And it was shortly after he and he left shortly before it was declared that, yeah, we're just going to give up. Actually, um, that's a she. Or, sorry, she. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah, I, I didn't completely understand that, but yeah, she stepped down from the board in order to do something national. Um, actually, there's there's a link here. Um, yeah, so. the, the foundation says that she stepped down entirely from her role, uh, that it was part of a planned leadership transition, and that she has moved on to national fundraising efforts into a role called keeper of the story and this is me being a cynical bastard um but given that she was one of the founders the founder uh you know key uh, in, instrumental in, in founding the organization um and you said that they raised over a million dollars this sounds a lot to me like she was trying to use this as a way to get out of the property by, I'll, I'll just, you know, use this foundation and, and raise a bunch of money and sell it to the foundation and, and all the money I've raised will just come to me. I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree. And, you know, being cynical here, I think that people are reluctant to buy property where people have been killed. I mean, it is a law that if someone dies in a house the the real estate agent has to disclose that. And so it might be that she looks at this very valuable real estate, which you can't do anything with. And if she can then sell it to the foundation, to turn it into a museum, then she gets money back. But the thing is, one of the things that they actually mentioned in this article 
why the foundation was shutting down was because they couldn't acquire the property from her. So maybe she was asking more than they either could pay or wanted to pay. I don't know. And to be honest, I don't that, care that enough to do sense. a deep dive, but yeah. But that, that actually, that last point you made, Aaron, that makes a lot of sense is the, the property, how long ago? Well, it was June 2016, so it's like seven and a half years, I believe. Right. So the property was worth X at that time. And then, you know, it takes a few years to get the foundation all set up and get these plans working. And then we get to maybe, say, 2020, when property went insane, and a lot of people decided that's what their property is worth. So whether whatever the value was, it's possible that she decided, this is what my property is worth, this is what I need to get out of that property, but the property was not actually appraised near what she was saying, so the foundation was going with the appraisal value, and she was standing firm on the other value. Could very well I've be. I've seen that happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen that kind of thing happen before, so... But we will most likely never know. Nope, that's that is true, and yeah, they're they're not not around anymore. And really, the the big thing I wanted to mention was that that this was not the same as the the George Decay One Pulse for America, which is I I I don't I don't know who came first. I, I assume this one came first. Um, and so if 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 that's so, you know, you. Know, George George was being a bit of a jerk because uh Aaron did you hear I mean there's nothing mentioned about any sort of partisan or politics that this is really just for memorializing the dead did, did you ever hear anything political out of this group keeping in mind that I didn't intensely follow it no I didn't hear that it was anything involving you know anti-gun rhetoric it was all about a memorial to the dead yeah, and that's and and that's 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 as far down as I want to go because mm-hmm. yeah, any org and especially you know given that this was a this was a gay nightclub, so you know there the 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 possibility that there might be a good chunk of people who may have been involved in this uh, in this club who were fans of gun control before any of this happened is uh is 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 a hundred percent so you know oh hearing this one person who is on the board or this one person there speaking out for gun control or oh they went you know they went up to to, to tallahassee to uh to uh to, to, to speak at the state house on such and such a gun control bill or all of that but not as a you know a member of this yeah, that's 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 all i want mm-hmm. i, I want to hear is just was there you know was there any you know, major, you know, partisan statements made by this group while it was still in existence, because there's nothing mentioned here uh, and all that. But but one thing that I do want to point out and OK, admittedly, I'm speculating, but I think I stand on a pretty solid foundation here is that if this had gone through and they had turned it into a memorial that any time any gun prohibition org wanted to do a press conference they would do it in front of Pulse because oh, that yeah. makes a Absolutely. stunning backdrop. Yeah. Even after being cleaned up, there'd still be plenty of blood to dance in. Well put, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. We've seen it all too often. We've commented on it all too often. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, stressingly. Well, it will be, it'll be interesting to see what, what happens to the, uh, what happens to, to, the, to the building. If they, I've got to assume at this point in time, they're probably just going to, just going to bulldoze it and, build fresh just because that would probably be the the easiest and the less uh i don't know difficult and who knows about what the it would simplify re- a lot of issues it would, it would simplify a lot of issues is exactly um the point um okay well oh here's another so coming up next we have another this is another follow-up story this is a, a much older we talked about um Can uh, i, I think take this was, one ab- absolutely david because this is this is a home turf story for me. Mm-hmm. So some people might remember that we talked about several times was in New York City there was a pro-Palestinian protest, and a city council member showed up at the protest, a Jewish woman, and she was reportedly armed with a handgun. And 
things kind of progress in an odd fashion. She was not arrested at the scene. The gun was not taken by the police at the scene, but she turned herself in later. Well, the update to the story is that as of about a week ago, the Brooklyn DA has dropped the gun charge against her because the weapon was inoperable. Apparently, I, I, I do want to add the one detail that the uh, pur- uh, purported to be at a protest with, with the gun. There were photos of her at yes. the protest with the gun sticking out of her waistband. Yes, but there is a funny part of the article that addresses that exact point that I'm going to get to in a moment. Well, yes. actually, as any competent defense lawyer would say, it appears to be a gun. We do not know. It might be a prop. Yes. A gun-shaped object. A gun-shaped object. as far as they could go. Mm-hmm. Yes. But so when she turned the firearm in and and gave herself up, the New York Police Department inspected the firearm and found it was missing the recoil spring assembly, which they claim makes the gun inoperable. <laughs> um, which, with uh... most guns, it's just a single shot at that point. Mm-hmm. It can still functionally fire a round. It just probably wouldn't survive the recoil of the slide coming back without a recoil spring to delay it. True, but, you know, let's not interrupt our enemies while they're making a mistake. Exactly. Yeah, like I said, this is over a week ago, so this is a, this is a done deal now. But so as a result, the prosecutors had to drop the charges and... One of the things... Uh, well, w- while you look that up, one of the things that I wanted to point out, and I'm not pointing fingers, I'm just being naturally cynical here, is uh, some people have pointed out that she could have removed the spring before handing it into the police. Absolutely. That's, yep. and, that's exactly what people are saying. Are, are claiming and well th- there's no way to prove otherwise because the police didn't take possession of it there and then oopsie boopsie yeah. right which is something that a ali najmi a criminal defense and election attorney who frequently works with democrats in the borough argued that the nypd could have acted faster quote i'm shocked that the nypd failed to arrest her at the protest the nypd should have removed the gun off of her themselves and carefully preserved the evidence at the scene of the crime there were a lot of police officers present at the time of the protest but here's the part that i thought in response uh or is it um her attorney was quoted as saying as of today there is no evidence that the gun works and there is no evidence that someone actually saw her with the gun which goes exactly back to Oddball's comment, which I was going to make as well, is like, um, there were photographs, but as Aaron pointed out, that was a gun-shaped object. <laughs> it's just, this is just all sorts of ridiculous, because one of the events that I mentioned that happened in Albany at the state capitol uh, in protest to one of the SAFE Act protests was there were guys that had foam core cutouts in the shape of ARs painted black that they were holding and waving about that had AR-15 painted on them, and the state police were sent out to confiscate them because they looked too gun-like. <laughs> yeah, but I, I just posted um, in chat a uh, the picture of her standing at the protests with the gun sticking out of it, out of her waistband. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, a uh, uh, gun shaped object. That, that, <laughs> that looks remarkably like a Beretta PX4. Could be, well, or it, or it could just be a blue gun that was painted black. <laughs> and I, 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 I it's, it's attorneys doing it. I, I will also say that. So one of the things that I naturally assumed seeing these photographs was that, she was one, you know, one of the many people who was not able to get a New York carry permit. And in fact, this is like one of the first times she'd ever carried a gun and just hadn't learned how to properly keep your cover garment over preventing printing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and all that. But it turns out that she has had a carry permit and has had one for a while. Mm-hmm. So, well, yeah, she was part of the, uh, the special class, but, so, but this is this is someone who who has been carrying concealed, uh, or alleged has had the capability of carrying has had concealed. the capability. Yes, there's there's some been some discussion about whether she had actually carried on that license more than a few times. Yes, uh, 
Well, she she has uh, definitely uh, doing some Google searching. She has definitely um, done some uh, posing carrying guns and different guns with different holsters. So uh, I, I'd say the chances are fairly high. Yeah. Some yeah. people have speculated that this was deliberate trolling on her part. That she was yes. there with a deliberately non-functioning gun. Mm-hmm. Although, you know, that, if that were the case, I would have, like, removed the firing pin as well. But whatever. But but she knew this was going to happen. And this was all basically to, you know, tweak the nose of New York and possibly get this law overturned. That's that's a, a valid theory. <laughs> and she yep. is a Republican candidate or office holder in a up until fairly recently traditionally democratic area but one of the things that's been happening over the past um not even decade is some of the neighborhoods in brooklyn the jewish neighborhoods specifically have been shifting conservative Uh, although Uh, i will will have to say dear lord somebody needs to teach her about gun belts (laughs) oh yeah with, with and that, that picture that's, I just posted. Woo! Yeah, that is definitely a gun bunny photo. But either way, my my point is saying that is that she was has the potential to not be completely green, though. Again, this right. that, that yeah, picture, she's not that, she's not completely gormless, but yeah, but th- which might lead to again what Oddball was or uh, what Aaron was saying on the the theory that maybe she was deliberately carrying it uh to to mislead and to uh raise raise ire um but it's impossible to 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 say without uh without a little bit more information that we're probably not going to have but certainly there's a potential that the idea that she was carrying that lazily strikes struck me as odd and my initial thought was oh this is clearly someone who's never carried before, but is decided to carry right now because of the nature of this protest that she was at. Um, but yeah, this is this is something that she has likely carried more than a little bit. So for it to be that exposed all the time, it seems deliberate, uh, doesn't it? It it seems extremely deliberate. Yeah, but it's uh, it's going to be interesting because, as I said, the the Brooklyn DA declared, or his office, I should say, I don't think he made the statement himself, but the, the Brooklyn DA's office made the statement that because the firearm appears to be non-functional, they will be dropping the charges. Well, you said that they were dropping the gun charges, and there's yes. actually something in the article saying that other charges are still pending and will be, she's got a court date for the end of January. So what are those other charges? Yeah, I I took a look, and all the charges that I found were related to the gun charges. So it was uh, brandishing, effectively. I, it called something different in New York, of course. Mm-hmm. But you know, the, the brandishing charge, the carrying in a, in a sensitive area charge. There was one other weapons-related charge that I, I'm blanking on. But those were the charges that I saw. I didn't find any information on other charges. I mean, I didn't do a, a really thorough search. Mm-hmm. But all the charges that I saw referenced were gun charges or weapons charges. So it might just be administration to formally clear everything out. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's, so I'm just, I'm not, I'm not sure where this is going to go in its entirety. I do know that there, it was reported that she, uh, in addition to turning in her gun, she also turned in her carry license. I don't know if the license was repealed. That can be done at the the whim of the judge or the DA, and it can be appealed. But those appeals pretty much never work. So, but yeah, the the case is still pending. However, according to the DA's office, it will be dismissed on or before their next court date, scheduled for January twenty fourth. Is at the very end of the article. So I'm wondering if that's like Aaron said, is the administrative stuff still has to be done? So the charges are technically pending, even though they've been dismissed. I don't understand regular law stuff, and New York City is a perverse variation on that, but it was somewhat entertaining. All right, who wants to go to Oregon? Okay, I'll handle this. 
All right. Don't die awesome. of dysentery on the way. <laughs> All right. So fans of me and what I, through Operation Blazing Sword, have been doing is that we have been f- busy filing amicus briefs against various gun prohibition laws. And one of the ones which we campaigned very strongly against was Oregon Measure 114, in which I believe I said that it drank deeply of the well of discrimination. And I'm very proud of that line. Beautiful phrase. Thank you. And I, I actually shared that in several places. Oh, thank you so much. With, uh, with attribution to OBSPP. That's perfect. Thank you. And so, yeah, Measure 114 has been bouncing around, and there's been the usual suite of appeals. And I want to remind people that it passed by just a razor-thin margin. I don't remember the actual numbers, but it, when it comes to passing a law, this one was really, really close. And so I've been keeping an eye on it because I'm invested in this. And earlier in the year, I want to say in the summer, it was brought before a federal judge. And the federal judge ruled that it was constitutional. And I had to have this explained to me because I got confused with this most recent ruling where it was declared unconstitutional. And I'm going, well, wait a minute. An Oregon judge declared it was unconstitutional, but a federal judge earlier said it was constitutional. How does that work? And I had it explained to me by a former prosecutor, and he explained very clearly that the federal judge declared that it was constitutional under the United States Constitution. However, this uh, judge in Harney County declared that it was unconstitutional under the Oregon state constitution. And in order for a law to take effect, it has to be constitutional under both federal and state constitutions. And so that was a very important distinction, and I hadn't realized that. Um, What I don't understand is how post-Bruin it could be constitutional under the Second Amendment. But that's a whole different, (laughs) yeah, confusing that I won't understand most of. Um, But I looked it up, and I didn't get the number... Ah, here it is. Oregon Measure 114, yay votes, 975,862. Nay votes, 950,891. So it was less than 25,000 votes out of 2 million. Yeah, I'm not good at math. I couldn't tell you what percentage that is. 50.65% yay. Oh, wow. So, a yeah, Razor Thin. Media website. Weird, do you want me to put that in the show notes? Please do. Can do. All right. So, in regards to why you said the federal judge declared it constitutional in a post-Bruin world, um, I, I'm not certain because I'm looking up, I'm trying to find out who that judge was, but if I had to guess, I would say... This was a federal judge with the Ninth Circus. Ah, enough said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, the, it the is. The Constitution says what we wanted to say when we wanted to say it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good old Ninth. So, uh, very predictably, the state is going to appeal this, and it will likely end up before the Oregon Supreme Court. And it's probably headed for SCOTUS, because, think- well, one of two things is going to happen, and I think they will both end up in SCOTUS. Uh, the f- the Oregon Supreme Court will say, you're right, it's not constitutional, and then the state's going to appeal again and try and get it right. before SCOTUS. Or the, the the Oregon Supreme Court is going to say, um, I don't know, I kind of lost my train of thought there. <laughs> uh, they could remand, was it remand it? Possibly. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. And honest, honestly, I'm not... I'm not sure how that works when if if SCOTUS uh, deals at all with something that is being challenged on a state constitution level. I would think it would stop the state constitution would stop at the state level. You know, that's a good point. And and it might. I don't know. The one thing that I have noticed is that it does seem that SCOTUS is collecting a whole bunch of gun cases and they may hear them all at once. Yeah, we've we've talked about that before. Mm-hmm. It makes us apprehensive. Definite apprehension there. Uh, I mean, I I wouldn't be surprised if SCOTUS 
between uh, California and Oregon, and I, I think that there's a case dealing with um, one up in New England. Um, I, I, I know there's one, at least actually two working their way through the New York court system. Uh, at, at some point in the near future, I, I, I think SCOTUS is going to have to deal with the assault weapons ban mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the not unsafe gun registry question. Well, I'm still waiting to hear, and I don't think SCOTUS has even heard it yet. I don't know where it is on the schedule, but there was the case challenging um, New York's Gun Improvement Act, where we filed uh, an AC alongside Columbia's Knight Institute challenging it on First Amendment grounds and haven't heard anything on that. I, I don't really know what's going on. Yeah, I haven't heard anything about it in months at this point myself. I did hear someone um, through m one of my NYSERPA contacts said that it was getting a slow walk, uh, but that's the last thing I heard. And okay, so I know what a slow walk is, but why? Uh, <laughs> that is a question beyond my knowledge. Okay. Because, because the state uh, knows it will lose and is throwing everything it can in, in front of it. Okay. Are they trying to basically outspend the defendants? Outspend and outlive. Okay. That makes horrible sense. Because, of course, the state has all the citizens' money to throw at a legal case. And all the time in the world. Yes. Because the state is not one person's lifetime. Ugh. Yeah. All right. Shall we move on to the next story? It's uh, a positive yeah. one uh, from our good friend Stephen Gutowski. Never yeah. heard of her. Uh, which uh, I don't think you guys have talked about yet. Um, but a federal judge in the uh, Fifth Circuit, uh, a, a district level court, has issued a uh, injunction, a, a nationwide injunction against the enforcement of uh, the ATF's pistol brace ban. Um, I didn't think that district-level courts could affect anything un uh, other than their district. How is this a nationwide ban? That's the question I was going to ask, Aaron. Thank you. Oh. Uh, because he said so, and <laughs> no higher-level court has said anything. Uh, okay. Uh, um, and is Is this actually within his authority or it's simply no one's questioned his authority to do that uh no one has questioned it oh. now wh whether it's under his authority or not um that's <laughs> that that's an interesting question but he but uh he that that was that was his, his uh his injunction was no you you can't do this uh and this applies to the entire nation, and this applies to everyone, which yeah, is... Originally, it was just the members of one or then several organizations. Uh, that was also a different case in front of a different judge. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it, uh, in front of a... <laughs> also in the Fifth Circuit, but... The uh, Fifth Circuit's been not, kind of knocking out of the park lately. Yeah, but but yeah, we, we, we had already had the ruling saying, yes... If you're in the Fifth Circuit and you are a member of one of these organizations, while this lawsuit is going on, there there's an injunction protecting you. Uh, this one actually says everybody no. everywhere all at once. Yeah, uh, and I was I I th this hit back on the eighth, and I have been waiting uh, to hear of the ATF. Um, trying to appeal the injunction and, and trying to take it to a higher court saying, no, that's an overreach. Cause, cause like Aaron said, this is a circuit court. This isn't uh, right. the, the, the appellate court. This isn't SCOTUS. Um, it isn't even a, a direct line to Biden's office. Right. Um, um, do you have any idea oddball how long the ATF would have to appeal something like this? I know there's a limited time period. Some, um some things well, like that. Well, here's the thing. The the injunction has gone in, into effect. 
Right. Um, and and the and this is this is an injunction. Uh, so this is only while the case is ongoing. Right. Um, now that said, to have this kind of injunction be put into place, the uh, one one of the things that has that has to be true is that the court uh, thinks that uh, the the uh, plaintiff's case has merit and is likely to win. Um, and uh, reading bits and pieces of the uh, deci- decision to put the injunction in place, it is quite clear that the judge is saying. No, the the ATF uh, is is going to lose this case unless yeah. if unless if they pull an impressive rabbit out of their hat. Uh, now, if, now the article, that said, oh, sorry, yeah. um, now that said, while on one hand, yay, happy, I don't like I don't like uh, how we're winning this one. Yeah, um, because it's not the the uh, plaintiffs are winning this one. Not using a Second Amendment argument. Yeah, that was my question. Was going to be that the article mentions the APA. Yes, it's unlawful under the APA. What is the APA? So the APA is the, I believe it is the American Procedures Act. Because okay. um, that's that. This is not defined in the article that I saw. Is this a right. matter of the ATF didn't file the proper forms? Yes. So specifically the logical uh, outgrowth test. Yeah. So specifically uh it uh the the court has it, it is saying that they've pretty much determined already that the uh ATF the uh, final rule that the ATF went with is a dramatic departure of the proposed rule for the uh arm brace ban that they put in front of everybody to to gather comments, et cetera, et cetera. So basically they got comments on this rule and then they passed a different rule under the same name. Correct. Uh, now, I mean, kind of like gutting a law. What one can, one can say, uh, and I'm sure the ATF argued that, Hey, the end result is we're banning most, uh, most of the pistol braces on the market. Um, it's just a question of how you get there uh, because the original proposal had that whole chart with a point system and yeah, apparently they dropped that, that fairly early in the comment process uh, to another article. Well, but the proposed rule had all of that uh-huh. and the rule that went into effect had a completely different system on determining whether or not an arm brace was an arm brace or a sh- or a shoulder stock, uh, which, a- as the court ruled, you y- you can't do that. While while the uh, th- while the end is the same, you you took a completely pa- different path to get there. You can't do that. Yeah. So there is a path outlined in the law that they did not follow. Uh, correct. Wow, so, the ATF going outside the law to get to their end results? That's never happened before, has it? Well, and, I mean, frankly, the ATF screwed up on this one. Um, and the and reason why I don't like it... either. The reason why I don't like it is there is absolutely nothing stopping the ATF from... Ju- and this might be why they're they're not appealing it. They, they may just set, send, send a lawyer out to be the lame duck to, to take the beating. And just when the court case is over, say, yep, you won. Great. That rule is gone. Um, we're, propose- we're proposing a new rule that is the exact same rule that they got spanked for. Th- th- this they time we filed for. correctly. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. This time we're going <laughs> to actually fill out the blue form instead of the red form. Or we'll use black ink instead of blue ink. Right. And then that would start a whole new legal challenge. And again, the ATF has way more money and time than individuals. Right. So what what I'm predicting is, yes, it looks like you can uh, put your uh, arm braces on uh, your your pistols right now. And uh, I, I, it looks like the ATF is going to let this court case play out. But 
I wouldn't be terribly surprised if we're right back in back in the mess in you know next year or so. Yeah, hooray! <sighs> I I I'm really leaning into hope on the yes, the Supreme Court is gathering up all these cl- cases to give one umbrella decision, and they're going to give it to Justice Thomas again. And it's oh, his yeah. and his decision's yeah. gonna be did I stutter? Yeah, and I'd I'd love to see um the arm brace thing with with them saying, Oh no, that that's actually uh a shoulder stock. One that would very quickly go with the oh, okay, there's definitely enough out in circulation that's in common use. Yeah, um, the low number is ten million. And or, uh, or eight there, million or something like and, that. And there, there is no uh, uh, historical analog. Um, and even if there were, according historical to analog of a ban of or restriction on them. Sorry, yeah, a, 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 a historical analog of a restriction on them. And uh, even if there was, according to the worst SCOTUS firearms ruling that I know of, um, Miller. Ah. Uh, yeah, Miller does not short, protect short short barrel, arms. Sh- uh, accor- According to the Miller decision, short barrel rifles should be protected arms. Because they are standard militia and military arms. Correct. Yeah, what's not protected under Miller is sporting and target guns. Right. A- and even then, you, you could argue uh deer rifles are because um of uh you know the the World Remington uh, well the <laughs> Remington 700 w- was used as a sniper rifle through uh through Vietnam. Vietnam yeah and basically single shot 22 rifles were used in military training mm-hmm. so but yeah it is it is just we fell so far and we're starting to claw ourselves back up but it's it's Two steps forward, one to one and a half steps back. Yeah, yeah, and and as you mentioned with New York, yes. there there are <laughs> some um, folks that don't learn from the first spanking. Either that, or they're not coming back for the hunting. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, it's it's. I was explaining to somebody about this as a pro Second Amendment advocate in New York. We never really won any of the battles. The best we could hope for was to not lose that battle as badly as we f- could have. And I was like, oh, we're going to ban all of this. Well, we, we talked them into only banning half of it. They'll come back for the other half the next time. Right. And we never gave up. We kept on fighting this rearguard action. And then Nyserpa versus Bruin happened. And it was like all of the pain and loss and sacrifice was worth something. And we we all kind of hoped that, great, this is it. It's a clear decision. We can rest. No. No. No, not even a little bit. But it's still, we are, we are as, I forget which one it was, what one of the pro-gun spokespeople said is, the gun control debate is over and and the uh the gun banners lost but the mopping up is going to take decades yeah or so, something to that effect well especially since you've got states right now who think they can get away with it and so far they have gotten away with plugging their ears going la 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 you can't make me uh-huh mm-hmm. and then of course <laughs> so i i enjoy listening to um what will be the opposite of a conspiracy theory? So, you know, if so-and-so is elected, they're going to do X, Y, and Z, even though that's probably impossible. So it's not a conspiracy theory. It's, is it a prospiracy theory? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, but I enjoy listening to those because it, for the same reason that, that uh, Jews in Eastern Europe would read the anti-Semitic rags about how what, we controlled everything. <laughs> It's it's nice that people think so well of us, Uh, but there's uh, in one of the gun groups, somebody was talking about how when Trump gets elected in 2024, okay, that's the first thing that we have to get past, but we'll go with it. 
Um, he's going to send the National Guard or the military into these states like the 101st Airborne was sent in after Brown versus the Board of Education. Um, okay. Are, are, is this prescription medication or... Can anyone partake? Right. Yeah, that that's... I, but that was the... I definitely got Forrest Whitaker eye from reading this person's post. Yeah. I was like, I, I, I'm intrigued by your ideas, and I would like to subscribe to your newsletter, but I think the spelling and grammar errors would kill me. <laughs> yeah, and of course, also, how, how committed was Trump on this ban to begin with? Right. I mean, he's... Whether it's true or not, the, how do you tell if a politician is lying, their mouth is moving... He was openly saying that it was the NRA that was pushing for this as a good solution to a problem we didn't have. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it, 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 there's a, certainly a grain of, of believability to it because the NRA really hasn't done much of anything since then because of the you know the, all the legal turmoil that they're that that they're in on various levels. So, Although they were one of the major financial backers for NYSERPA. That's true. That's true. NYSERPA could not have happened without the NRI NRA basically paying the lawyer. So but the, either way they, they have they have not been doing not doing visual, much. Though visibly, yeah. Speaking speaking directly with the president of the United States and the president has been speaking directly at the, at your conventions, you would think that they, they might find some time. So, yeah, yeah, you think so, you know, uh, but I, I don't know. It's one of those c- clearly guns are not a high priority for Donald Trump. Otherwise, either we wouldn't be getting these, you know, we wouldn't have had that, that, uh, that very, very um, <laughs> diametrically opposed uh, presidency where he was speaking with the NRA and being so uh, active about telling us how much he's one of us and then turning around and actually banning his stuff. So take the guns first, due process later. Uh, yeah. That was what he said. Yep. yep. I was told that when I, I mentioned that in a uh, discussion somewhere that I was taking him out of contact. I'm like, no, that's literally what he said. Yeah. And on that topic, you can see the video. Yep. And again, I mean, even, just to just to put a put a bow on it i mean even if even if there was going to be more draconian legislation coming down the pipe and the ban on bump stocks was to essentially feed the crocodile he didn't have enough there there weren't enough votes to make it to 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 make it uh, to make it veto proof he could have vetoed anything so yeah this as <laughs> like you said it was a solution to a problem we didn't have correct and yeah and you know, we had all these speculations when there was first talk, you know, after, after the, after the Las Vegas shooting and there was talk that bump stocks may, may be going away. I, I thought the brilliant move would be to do what they did, declare bump stocks, machine guns under shaky legislative ground. I mean, this, the, 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 the 4d chess Trump that doesn't oh, exist. Yes. The 4d chess Trump would do, would do the, all right, ATF declare declare uh, bump stocks machine guns. I sign an executive order creating either either just fully repealing the Hughes Amendment or at least putting a moratorium for a short period of time so that people can register their bump stocks rather than having to destroy them or uh, or turn them into police, and so people can register that. And of course it wouldn't be just for registering bump stocks. It would be an open to Hughes. And so people could register anything and everything uh, out there so that we could get a huge bolus on full auto firearms back on the registry and therefore drop the prices of, uh, of, of full auto, full auto firearms because suddenly the registry could double or triple overnight. Uh, and, uh, Oh, and and furthermore, you know, if you are registering your bump stock equipped uh, AR as a machine gun, well, 
there's nothing stopping you from taking the bump stock off, putting on a regular stock, putting on a short barrel, and also putting an auto sear in it. So, so that would have been that would have been a very very interesting trade, and I think a trade most people would be very very happy with. Um, and then and then furthermore, it would then get ruled, you know, get challenged in the courts, and then thrown out, and and, and then thrown out. So you get the you get the amnesty. Uh, for the for for the firearms uh, for the uh, for the machine gun registry, and you would get the case thrown out. So we would we would gain everything. Instead, we lost everything. So all or thanks, nothing Trump. usually winds up with nothing. Yeah. So yeah, but I mean that's 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 something that I'm just generally grumpy about is that is that we so often get quote unquote pro gun Republicans who do absolutely nothing about firearms and then the, talk a good talk. Yeah, and then the anti gun Democrat uh, Democrat comes in and you know in the case of Joe Biden we got the you know the the Saver Communities Act, which is, you know, not a barn burner as far as gun control laws go, but they got something. Right. And we always get either uh crumbs or like i said about the battles in new york losing less than we might have mm-hmm. yeah you know, law dogs cake analogy here yes all right moving on oh this 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 one is this one is one of the ones that i was very very excited about um so uh so uh after um uh, I guess after Sandy Hook, uh, Maryland passed a, uh, a a gun licensing law. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, yeah, it, it's, it's 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 a it's a it's it's a it's a handgun ownership license requirement. Uh, they got sued, and uh, and it it is at this state uh, at this point in time. It it was it was struck down. Uh, by the by, by an appeals court, and uh, I am again. We're in that this magical limbo period. Yes, this is a win. This is a very very good win. But this is also just another step in the you know in the process that is getting us up to the Supreme Court, which is the only place where this will really be a final say. Uh, but as I, I, I noted, that as a resident of Massachusetts, which is one of the two states that requires a permit to own any sort of firearm. There are several other states that require uh, a permit to own a, uh, a pistol. Um, and so the by, uh, so this has a potential of affecting a, a, a decent number of states and it's a really, really, really nasty, uh, nasty gun control law to have a permit for ownership because uh unfortunately i suspect most of us uh have have gone to renew our permit and had it t- taken much longer than it should have uh because there's uh, such a high demand i have not <laughs> La- okay. laughs in, in floridian york, uh, yeah in new york when i was there the permit was lifetime mm-hmm and I have not been here in Tennessee long enough to have to renew the permit I've gotten here. But from what I've heard from students, it basically they go to the DMV, they do the renewal payment, and then they go, and it shows up uh, in their mail in the next week or two. And now you can do that renewal online. Right. So when I renewed my concealed weapons permit four years ago, it was what you would consider uh, outpatient. I, I went to a branch. I didn't even have to go to City Hall. I just went to a branch, and I handed in my old permit. I might have had to fill out a form. I'm not sure. They took a new picture, and I was out within, well, it was definitely under an hour. I think it was under 30 minutes. It it might be even less than that, because I went to sort of an out-of-the-way place, Um and it was like during the afternoon when I think most people were working. So yeah, it was just in and out for me. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, and wait, I, and wait, wait, 
Aaron, is that the title of your sex tape? <clears throat> I wasn't paying attention enough. What what would be the title of my sex tape? It in was and just out. in and out for me. I mean, for purposes of the joke, it works. I mean, That's I, all I ask. That's all. And I ask. And, and 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 you're right. The the last time I renewed my Florida permit as well, it was I was I was in and out the same the same. I I renewed it when I was down in Florida and and uh, yeah, I just I went down I went down to an office. They yeah they took my picture. I, I thought they refingerprinted me. Um and then uh yeah and then I and then I was out and and then I got the permit relatively soon afterwards. And uh uh so yeah there 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 was there was that really? uh I but mean, the big issue that I'm the, they printed uh, mine out right then and there. I I had it when I physically oh. left. Oh okay. I now I'm now it's foggy. Um uh, but uh but yeah, so the um uh, but either way the uh, Well, I mean the difference might be that I'm a Florida resident and you had a non-resident permit. That's true. I I think it was mailed to me. So I don't know, but either way, the, the, the big issue that I'm getting at is that very, very frequently my Massachusetts permit expires and I, and, and I do not have the new one yet. And it's not only my permit to carry, but is my permit to own. And that there, and there's technically a grace period in there where, you know, you're going through, but even that gets, was the last two times I've renewed has gotten very, very close to, uh, to, uh, to, to expiring as well. It's just super duper dodgy. And again, this is for everything. And so, yeah, the, this is something that absolutely needs to go and is about as blatant uh, a second amendment uh, violation as you can get. This is directly a poll tax. You are paying and asking permission to exercise a right. The thing that bothers me about this ruling is the reason that they ruled. They didn't rule that it was a violation of someone's Second Amendment rights, but they ruled that requiring applicants to wait up to 30 days for a handgun permit violated their constitutional rights. In other words, if you can get that down to, I mean, they didn't say, but you know, if you can get it down to two weeks, if you can get it down to one week, then having this permit might be okay and i don't like that no that is that's not great yeah no. i i'd have to uh I, i'd have to reread things but i was thinking that their uh reasoning which which again having to go through it period i i think it's an infringement but I, but i think they were going along more more along the lines of hey Going in and saying, "Yeah, you have to do a background check." That's one thing, but a a right delayed is is a right denied, and and all that fun stuff. So, so unless it's gun rights, I apparently. I well, I I got the impression that in this case, I I got the impression that uh they they were that they were aiming more at the no, we're 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 still we're not going to strike down the instant background check, right? But uh, as long as it's pretty much instant. Right, as long as it's a, a time frame that is reasonable to to say yes, this is uh, this was going to take, and it does not um, actually put an encumberment on the citizen, yeah. which is. I would like to see a challenge to the application of the New York State handgun permit process, because under New York State law. They have six months to oh, process yeah. a pistol permit application. Yeah. Under the law, they have six months. The state decided that what that really meant was six months clock starts ticking when it's placed in front of the judge. Yeah. And the majority of the processing that gets done is before it gets to the judge. Right. So they can, it can take eight months before it's put in the judge's bin. Well, and I mean, that, that's just, that's one of those things that if you if if they can get it in front of an honest judge, it's it's a real easy thing to say. Wait, this person has turned it in. The paperwork it's under its control, and the times that the time hasn't started ticking. That's no, yeah. that's not how this. Yeah, works. I mean, unfortunately, rebrewing that would 
just die at the uh, the state appellate court, if not earlier, because people just didn't have the money to go against the state right. on that. But in a, in a- well, and and unfortunately, as we've talked before, states have a nasty tendency to go, oh, this person's actually suing about it. Magically, it's granted to them, and they no longer have and, and anything yeah. to complain about. Yep. Or no. like with the uh, the gravity knife lawsuit. Oh, we'll just change that law so now it doesn't have this effect, so the case is mooted. Right. But as we've seen in the past couple of years, there's been getting more and more judges that are getting tired of those shenanigans. Oh, yes. So. Yes. And I hope more and more of them. Mm-hmm. But the next one is local for us and good news. Ah, yes. So since uh, since you live in the capital, the, <laughs> the city of the article. Yes. Uh, so, and actually, I, I think I was the one that shared this article with, with you a while ago. Um, yeah, I saw it, it in in uh, news locally, but you shared uh, it, you shared it first. Uh, according to multiple news sources. Um, the Tennessee ERPO bill, which is uh, the red flag bill that was brought up uh, during our special session that we had, which was all so- sorts of fun fun and games for everybody. Uh, but that is being declared, quote, effectively dead, unquote, uh, with our governor dropping sponsorship of it. Um, uh, he has said, yeah, he, he's... He he's seen the tea leaves, and he he's being told that yeah the the uh the 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 population of Tennessee does not want this, um and so he he's dropping sponsorship of it, which pretty much means that it is dead at least for now. I mean, it was uh, his bill. Yeah, it was, right? it was his bill. Yeah. Uh, so when the sponsor of the bill drops sponsorship. That's a sign. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and he and he was seriously pushing for it in the specials uh, to to be passed during the special session that he uh, that he called for. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, sanity uh, is is prevailing at least a little bit in, in that respects. Speaking of Tennessee legislators and sanity prevailing. Shortly after the uh, the October 7th attacks in Israel, uh, Lieutenant Governor Rand McNally came to our synagogue for, you know, to show solidarity and support oh. and whatever. And I had been, you know, doing the sitting outside guard stuff, and it was decided above my pay grade that it probably would not be a great idea for me to be there after some <laughs> of the comments I made about wanting to ask him about the lieutenant governor, why he is not supporting more pro-gun laws, especially in light of this type of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, yeah, we're not going to need you that Saturday. Thanks. <laughs> like, that's legit. Yeah. You, you don't want to, you don't want to corner the, uh, the lieutenant governor on something like that. <laughs> Maybe you do. I, 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 I do. I, I know one or two people that, that would love to Just, do that. Just, oh, wow. a, just a little bit of peril. <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I would have been smiling. Well, my lips would be pulled back from my teeth. That's smiling, right? <laughs> uh, so, but that is—it's a good reading of the populace. Is is what I think with with the mm. Urpoville basically dying, unless he's decided that he's going to try to sneak it through some other way. But the fact that he proposed it, people are going to be paying a little more attention, I think. Yeah, I mean, and the uh, what I've seen, uh, for the most part, the Republicans uh, in this state have no desire to touch it. Um, Yeah, of course. Not that they seem to have much desire to improve the gun laws much either. No, Uh, they're they're not anti-gun, but they're not actively pro-gun. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and of course, there there's the usual suspects that are screaming that oh they they just want to that that the evil Republicans want to 
kill babies and and all that yep. fun stuff. And and all that the people screaming want is common sense gun control. Yeah, yeah. And there's certainly something to be said about uh, about this beca- being a, 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 an ERPO law instead of say an assault weapons ban law or one gun a month or you know you name your other gun boilerplate. The these you know ERPOs, red flags, and those sort of things seems to have been the for a while where the was the gun control that had slipped under the radar, and even relatively pro gun politicians were supporting it, and they were popping up darn near everywhere, and the fear was that they were going, especially with the uh, uh, the Safer Communities Act uh, in place, that they might spread like wildfire. And uh, this is another good sign of the maybe they won't. Well, and yeah, and it's in large part because red flag laws sound like a good idea. Uh, Like so much. Um, I mean, I think they only sound like a good idea to the ignorant, but okay. Well, I mean, on, on the surface, they sound like a good idea. Yeah. It's as it's as soon as you take a look, even an inch below the surface, mm-hmm. the problems start cropping yeah. up. And, and uh, also, when you start looking at, okay, how can this be abused? That and you, you realize start, all the ways that you start getting the robot waving its arms, going "Danger, real Robinson! Danger, danger!" Um, That's Robbie the robot. Yes, thank you. Whose name originally was Robot? I thought so Robbie I the robot the first. Was, was the Forbidden Planet. Robot. Robbie the robot was lost in space. Well, it was lost in space. Yeah. Okay. Which was the same ro- robot as used in Forbidden Planet, which was called Robot. Gotcha. Because no one wanted to bother coming up with a name for a robot. <laughs> <laughs> this this old TV and movie trivia brought to you by Kellogg's Post Toasties. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say by, by 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 the oldest member of the ACP staff. Get off my. I mean, at least I've seen a few episodes of Lost in Space. Have you ever seen Forbidden Planet? Yes. It's um, basically a science fiction version of Shakespeare's The Tempest. More or less, yeah. It's definitely... I, I, I don't think it's more or less. Influenced. I think it literally is. I was going to say, it's at the very least, it's strongly influenced by, but it, it, you're right, it may very well be they were making a, a an outer space version. Although I don't remember the robot in Shakespeare's version. Well, okay, you are correct, but I believe... I was also being silly. But I believe... It's been a while, both since I've seen the movie and since I saw the play, but I I don't remember if the robot takes the place of Ariel or Caliban, but de- definitely does one of those. Was... Is that the one with Prospero? Yes. Yes. Okay. And and Forbidden Planet, curiously enough, was one of Leslie Nielsen's rare serious roles. Yeah. Well, he was uh, prior not, to not the, rare. Up to that point, he'd mostly done serious roles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah wasn't it? Wasn't it until Airplane that he that he really kind of switched over to exclusively comedy? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but also um, uh, police, police uh, squad, police squad. Yeah. Was I want to really say before police squad, he he uh, was pretty much entirely. A serious dramatic actor, and then he found his niche. Oh, and I'll, I'll note that in the uh, movie Creep Show, which was that eighty six, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, eighty two was it? Okay, yeah, yeah. It, 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 yeah, there's a there is a vignette with it's uh, Leslie Nielsen and uh, and Ted Danson in a, yes. mm-hmm. and it's and it's fully serious. Are, are you sure? Are you sure that was a serious movie? Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> the whole premise is that it's all living pages of a pulp comic book. So, yeah. So, David, one of the things you said didn't sit right with me, and I did some Googling, and I need to correct you, not only because I'm pedantic, but also because hey. um, we may very well have listeners call in and saying that you're wrong. And I'm okay with being wrong. And um, Robbie the Robot from Forbidden Planet is not the same robot as Robot from Lost in Space, because Robbie is the one that very clear, very clearly has a human being inside the suit, whereas Robbie may 
also have a robot. Uh, we also have a human inside, but that's the one with like the floppy accordion arms. And you can see photographically from the links that I'm posting, they are two very different. Yeah, you are absolutely correct. My brain conflated them. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've seen any Lost in Space. But yeah, they they both clearly have people inside, but they are different form factors. Yes, and and the Robbie but, one, you know, a person can move around more, whereas robot, I think that they're just bolted in there and maybe do the arms and not much else. Yeah. I also got it reversed that Robbie was in Forbidden Planet and Robot was in Lost in Space. I re- I got that reversed. No, that's correct. Okay. No, I think I said it the other way around. I oh, okay. You did say it the other way around. Cause that, that's, Robot that's, oh, in Lost in Space. That's how he got talk, talk, talking about Forbidden Planet, because I'm like, I'm pretty sure Ro- Robbie was Forbidden Planet. Yeah. But you can see that they definitely came, the both Robbie and Robot, <laughs> came from the uh, the same design family. Sure. I mean, certainly the, the, those those accordion tubes, it was a, was a very, very good way to add articulation to a suit mm-hmm. without it being too conspicuous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially when they were attracted. Aha! Yes, the film's plot is loosely based on William Shakespeare's play The Tempest, with the planet mm-hmm. Altair IV standing in for Shakespeare's remote island and Dr. Mor- Morbius for Prospero. In this context, Robbie is analogous to Ariel, a spirit enslaved by Prospero. Good call. <laughs> well, what was funny is that you know, I didn't know that when I'm watching it, and I'm watching the movie, and I'm going, wait a minute, this is Shakespeare, you sneaky buggers. It's mm-hmm. Shakespeare with robot and grenades. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, given the given the, the movie poster where you have, you know, Robbie carry, car- carrying the lady and all that, and looking all monstrous. Uh, I, I I would assume it was Caliban because Caliban is certainly much much more of the beast in uh, in, in in that. I love I love the Tempest. That's that's my favorite Shakespearean mm. play. Well, I mean, it's a loose adaptation. They might have taken parts. By the way, good luck getting us back on track. I have no idea where we are at this point. Uh, Blue Bell Shooter sought to murder upper class white people. Ah, yes. So yeah, that that's so that this is a this is another one of the uh, last. I, I have limited skills interrupting weird and keeping track of where we were. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have limited skills. People have heard your segments. Okay. You you are a man of many many talents, but uh, the in, uh, including finding homes for lost kittens. Yes, this <laughs> yes, this <sure> was <laughs> this was like Yet. this was officially the uh the the story that uh that was that, that got me to say all right guys don't worry about don't don't worry about segments for monday everybody have a good thanksgiving and we're gonna round table it was that yeah uh uh was this the what day was thanksgiving was this the uh, thursday thanksgiving was thursday yeah. so literally this was the this was the, the 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 day before thanksgiving and i actually had put my daughter to bed and come down to my office to, uh, to, to publish the, publish the show and, uh, for, for our Patreon subscribers. And, uh, and then, uh, and then I was going to put some fine, fine, fi- uh, finishing touches on a blooper reel and friend of the show with a common name had posted that the, uh, the, that the police report for the, uh, the Louisville bank shooter had been made public. And, uh, there's, I mean, there's so much to go on here. I mean, the first statement is why now? Cause this was very much like the, uh, Nashville, uh, shooter. This was one of those things of the, it was immediately reported that there was documentation. I will, I will not label it in one way or another on saying whether it's a diary manifesto suicide note etc uh though in this case i'm pretty comfortable saying manifesto um, the, the important question is was the shooter known to law enforcement um short answer yes uh this this one not quite as much as some of the o- other shooters though this person had been voluntarily committed to a uh, to to a mental hospital after a uh, suicide attempt yeah, the voluntary part is key 
in regards to firearms ownership. Yes, yes, this this is this is very key. I've I've heard some people. I heard some somebody report that that the only reason why they 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 were able to get the gun was they lied on their forty four seventy three, and I I don't believe that's true. They believed that, and it says so in their uh, in 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 their journal that they believe that they lied on the uh, on the 4473 and therefore got the got the firearm but uh technically speaking that shouldn't make a difference because if you lie on it you'll still get it's it, the uh the the FBI records the FBI record I know hardy har har because the FBI has been well known for well the FBI and the various states and uh, and other law enforcement agencies have been known for being piss poor about actually reporting uh various disqualifying crimes uh to it but in uh, in this case the the killer did appear to have had a a a, a clean background uh i would argue that i i, I would i would su- i would suggest that maybe this got released uh, when it did a right before, you know, in the evening before the, the Thanksgiving weekend, which is a great journalistic trick for killing, killing a story that you don't want the public to see because people are traveling, people are having Thanksgiving. And by the time they come back, it's old news. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, you get a lot of stories that are dropped on a Friday evening and a ton of stories dropped before, or a long or a holiday weekend. And so, yeah, in, in, in this case, I wonder if this was done because of the fact that Steven Crowder had gotten somebody to leak the, um, uh, the, uh, the manifesto from the, uh, or at least a, three pages from the manifesto from uh, Nashville um, uh, to, uh, 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 to him that I wonder if they were worried that their time was time was limited on how long they could keep this under wraps. Cause certainly it's been, um, I mean, it was, this happened in the spring. So it was over six months ago that this, uh, that event had happened, but the, let's not bury the lead. The key factor is that, uh, as I believe I suge- suggested when we were, reported on this after it happened that there were definitely rumors that the killer may have been motivated by wanting to push gun control that is laid out in black and white uh that yes absolutely this person was a staunch supporter of gun control uh uh viewed i mean described the ar-15 that 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 they bought as a weapon of mass destruction and indeed was um you know was attempt was was doing it to promote gun control and specifically was targeting white people now i so, realize i'm trying to make sense of a crazy person and yeah, i was thinking the same thing <laughs> well and and this isn't because the person spent time you know in a mental institution but i'm saying anyone who decides to go out and murder people you know i question their sanity but <sighs> Oh, gee, I don't like that people are dying. I want more gun control. So in order to protest people dying from guns, I'm going to go murder a bunch of people with a gun. What? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he also, he's technically a terrorist by the definition of he was trying to use violence and fear to make political change. Yeah, he well, also... The, the thought process is... Well, these things are terrible and horrible because you can do this. Let me show people how this can happen, and therefore, clearly, they will wake up and uh, I, and and stop people from being able to get these horrible things. I, and I, yeah, I think I think I think that is the in the statement about the I'm going to kill rich white people, so maybe politicians will listen. Now is the idea being that if it is mostly inner city uh, poor uh, poor people and people of color that are being killed by gun violence. Maybe now they will listen if it is a bunch of rich white people. And if it's uh, people they actually care about. Yes. And, uh, and also I, by his own statement, it makes it a hate crime. Oh, a hundred percent. Except uh, crimes against white people can't be hate crime. Well, we'll, we'll leave, we'll leave that one, that one alone for historically the non, speaking for the nonpartisan nature of ACP. But, uh, yeah. uh, 
that certainly has been argued i will i i, I will very, very diplomatically say um uh, but um uh, but yeah this so that was the motivation uh, another uh interesting aspect of this is that the killer bought the gun less than a week before the shooting uh yeah. they um uh they they openly said that the people didn't the people that they were they were going to kill didn't deserve to die so there was no vindictiveness directly towards these people other than assuming he saw them as actual people at that yeah in there well there's a lot of what can clearly be read as narcissistic uh you know ideologies in this so that that's certainly an 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 aspect to this right right Um, up there with sociopathy yeah and uh, well all sociopaths are narcissists but uh per per the dsm uh but um Either way, the this person when they when they planned out the attack, they planned out the memes they were going to put on their Instagram. They planned on live streaming it, which I, I don't know if they actually were successfully able to do. I I don't remember seeing any a, any live streams or any reports of, of of a live stream. And I I I tend I I I've generally caught all the live streams that uh, that have uh, that have gone out. So that maybe did, didn't didn't quite work out, uh, but the the killer entered the uh, the the bank. They uh, got the gun out of a gym bag, and uh, and then uh, went out, encountered a female in the uh, in the hallway, said it's time to go, and then pointed the the uh, the rifle at her and pulled the trigger, and the hammer dropped on an empty chamber. And apparently the person had had either failed to uh, to chamber around or had did it improperly and then the, so they they racked the action and then managed to get a shot off hit the victim in the leg that p- person was able to crawl away to safety and uh, ended up surviving uh then the person went oh, started essentially s- snooping around the uh, the office until he came across a uh, conference room and then started firing into the conference room. And that's where the majority of the people that were killed in this, uh, this event were killed. And uh, after they had finished shooting there, they, well, oh, before they entered the conference room, uh, the, the killer racked the, uh, the action again and ejected a live round. So there's certainly a lot to be said about this is very likely the first time this person ever shot the gun. And uh, the gun was equipped with a red dot sight, so I wonder if even if that sight had been zeroed. So there's 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 a lot of amateurish behavior here. But also, after that first magazine was more or less expended, I, I, I don't remember if it said in the report if it, it fully expend, expended the magazine. But uh, the killer reloaded, and then kind of lost their nerve and just kind of paced around the uh, uh, the bank until the uh, the first police car showed up and then they started engaging with the police and uh uh ended up hitting one officer but uh but a uh, another officer did end up uh, killing him at the scene so yeah that it's there's a lot to be seen on this and this is again this is why I have been staunchly in favor of releasing the the Nashville uh shooters manifesto and in, any in full yeah, any yeah, in full exactly. Yeah, this this the Steven Crowder leak is data, but again, without the without the full context, there is certainly something. Th- th- there's there's a lot missing. There's a lot missing, and 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 there's a lot of things that are that uh, that may be in there that aren't aren't there, and there may be some stuff that changes the context of it. So. Uh, ab- ab- absolutely released in full and again there's a lot to learn about you know these you know you know these these situations and again one thing that we almost always see is these shooters are not good shooters you know this this person planned did a ton of planning as far as what to do when to do it where to go uh, yeah even even left 
even left a very makeshift last will and testament, which I will say had a, had a level of irony of the I killer's name uh, being of sane mind, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, sane minded, sound body. Well, except for you just were talking about murdering innocent coworkers before and after in yeah. this. In, no in one this with experiment. a sound mind does that. Yes. So yeah, the, the, but either way, the fact that this person did a lot of planning on the fame seeking behavior, uh, and, uh, d- on, on the, on the fame seeking behavior, but not a lot on the actual executing of it. I mean, it seems that they kind of lost their nerve. Uh, could even been that they, they didn't, they realized that killing people wasn't quite as exciting as that, they, as they, as they initially intended. I don't yeah. know, but, uh, we never will. Nope. And, one of those uh, others. yeah, but, uh, but that's, this is one of those things on the, well, this is also one of those things on the fight back. And like, even if you're in a gun free zone and you're obeying that, you know, this is one of those ones where, you know, if you're in an institutional setting, there's going to be fire extinguishers regularly uh, spaced around the building, grab yeah. one and put it through their head, empty, you know, empty it into them and then, and, and then brain them with the, with the empty cylinder. You know, just fight back and fight back viciously because. What's the know, saying? This, like you're the third monkey on the ramp of Noah's Ark, and it's beginning to rain. Exactly the the this person started off with an empty chamber and had to rack rack around in there, and I I don't know how practiced or smooth it was. I gotta imagine it was like a brand new shooter learning to rack an AR action for the first time. Um, and so like this first woman could have charged him and even a a woman versus a man with a rifle better than nothing um there's you know there's a lot lot to be said uh in these instances the the evidently the 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 shooter in Maine had a fairly nasty jam and actually took almost a minute to clear while in the bowling alley and like that must have been like a, a bolt over base because or even a base over bolt but yeah I, bolt yeah. over base is the more common occurrence that would cause a clearance issue that took that long yeah because if there's a round jam in the chamber you mortar it if that doesn't clear it you the gun's out of service without a shop yeah and who knows he might have tried to muscle his way through instead of mortar it i i don't i don't know i, I have but, i have no I have but a, just I my, my armor hat automatically appeared on my head yeah but either way the um so you've got to look for these opportunities because assume that all right there's you're 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 in a you're in a public place and someone showed up with a gun and they're now shooting you can consider yourself dead but so act act accordingly yeah so the you know this is that's that's the time for the the stupid bravery to come out because you're you're in a pretty bad place. So, and again, this is showing that the gun control people are are chumming up monsters, and that these people and and this was suppressed possibly by the mayor of Louisville, who is rabidly anti-gun. We've we've covered some of his anti-gun rants and ravings uh, in the past on this show, uh, but yeah. This could have very well been suppressed by him when the police reported that, oh, yeah, no, he was saying, thanks, thanks to the NRA for making this so easy. This shouldn't be this easy. I shouldn't I shouldn't have this gun. Well, you know, if if you didn't have that gun, you shouldn't have bought it. Well, but the point is that they're saying I shouldn't have this gun. So no one else should have it either. That's correct. That that is correct. And. You know, never mind the fact that it was an AR-15 that uh, that 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 uh, split this dude's skull open and ended his uh, and his little reign of terror, and uh, you know, and never mind that if anybody in that bank had had a firearm and had a minimal amount of range time, things would have probably gone a lot differently. Yeah, good time. I mean, that's one word for it. Yeah. Now, speaking of good times, I'm guessing weird you put this next one in because you just love kicking yourself some Alec Baldwin 
Scrotum. Oh, I, I, yeah, I put, I put that one actually. The, 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 uh, yes. Yep. No, that's, I was, I was reading the wrong one. There, there we go. Yes. The, uh, yes, this one is a, a very, very, it's a video and, uh, it covers a number of, uh, of gun, of gun news, but one of them is some footage from the movie rust was leaked and it shows Alec Baldwin. In a, say his name correctly. <laughs> Alec Baldwin. Oh no. Thank you. Uh, uh, Alec Baldwin doing one of the gunfight scenes in the uh in the movie and he is on several occasions giving direction uh to the to to the crew to move in various places so that when he swings the gun around from the position there's a bunch of things where he's falling down and and shooting from odd positions that when the gun he doesn't want to have the muzzle traverse a live person uh for the scene and of course this is obviously with a blank firing gun uh and or a gun loaded with blanks obviously we know that the firearm that he used and most of the revolvers used in movies is is not modified to take blanks it's, it's just not, yeah, it's not just, necessary it's not necessary so you just don't do it you just load it up with blanks uh but uh but it shows which is really sad. Again, one of my statements about Rust is that the 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 uh, you know Helena Hutchins and the uh, uh, and the director should have never been in front of Alec Baldwin for this scene. And the you know it's against the you know the four rules of gun safety. It's against the uh, the SAG AFTRA rules for safe gun handling on set you know all of this there are lots of precautions that could have been done again it was a digital likely a digital film camera i don't i or a digital movie camera I, I even so any- the monitors as long as you have a long enough cable could be anywhere they didn't have to be in yeah. the building mm-hmm. yeah and so yeah exactly they, 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 they mean yeah they could have been i mean i've i've i have definitely seen um you know seen seen stories of directors directing the B crew on the other side of the planet yeah. as they're shooting B roll footage. And yeah. the director is reviewing, reviewing the footage more or less in real time. Obviously there's going to be some delay over that large a distance, but mm-hmm. again, there's, there's, there's nothing, you know, stopping you from being somewhere else using Wasn't that modern part of uh, the movie we did for the film track about the cast of that crazy movie being stuck oh, in the hotel the bubble. the bubble yeah wasn't that actually part of the the joke in that movie at one point it may have been it was a really good movie but i don't know uh, if i'd say really good it was a really fun movie i enjoyed the hell out of it actually but e- that just means way. it was really fun doesn't yeah. mean it was really good yeah but either way <laughs> either way what i'm trying to say yes. is no, but I'm, I'm agreeing with you that this is really chilling because not only should the director have known better, I, I mentioned the fact that Alec Baldwin has a, a director credit as well. So therefore, a, a lot of the the guild rules that may not have been uh, as 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 well played through for uh, a, an actor uh, would have been added, you know, added to his uh, his briefing as a director. You know, the director should have known that he and the the you know he and Helena Hutchins should not have been behind that camera they should have been off to the side somewhere outside the building uh, especially given like i said the um that the uh hannah reed the armorer was not even in the building because of allegedly because of covid restrictions yeah. that, oh and uh the director joel souza okay thank you uh, i'm horrible with names so i had to look it up yeah i i, I wasn't concerning my I, the only one i was really concerning myself was was helena hutchins just because she she was killed and, yeah, but uh, and, we and should also that. mention the name of the injured party as well. Yeah, that's in, true. In fairness. Yeah, though I, I I am fairly uncharitable about the fact that I think that he holds far more responsibility than he is uh he is being held for just for simply allowing this to happen. Uh, you know, not just the live ammo getting in. That 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 can be explained away, 
but just the fact that Alec Baldwin drew a firearm from a shoulder holster while on camera and pulled the trigger and it hit two people. Uh, I mean, directly is inexcusable, um, especially with the technology that we have today. Uh, yeah. So, and, and then furthermore, it just gets that much worse is that clearly while on the set of rust, he was exercising very, very good gun safety, or at least being very conscious about gun safety while shooting scenes with a firearm. And so to have Alec Baldwin go from, Hey, I don't want to point this gun at you when I'm swinging around for this shot. So can you please get on the other side of the camera? And yet then suddenly having an instance where he is drawing a gun and pointing it at, at them. Now, granted, in Alec Baldwin's defense, the it's been said over and over again, and it's essentially indisputed that when the uh, the the uh, the assistant director handed, who was acting as the armorer in this instance, handed him the gun, he said "cold gun" without Again, obviously checking it. I would the, the yeah, AD did not check it. Yeah, the AD did not the AD did not check it, and I would argue that the one argument that Alec Baldwin had against clearing a firearm, which he knew how to do, yep. uh, is that he's been yelled at in the past by the armorers for doing that. Messing uh, with on a that, prop gun. Which I can understand as if you are, say you have a revolver and you have a blank that's going to be fired, but also the rest of the rounds are hero rounds that are dummies that look legit so that the way the camera is looking at it, it will look like there are live. So there's live ammo you in the gun. See the bullets at the front of the cylinder. Yeah, as it discharges, or you're accidentally ejecting a round or causing a jam in the gun, clear, trying right. to open the action to do a brass check or what have you. Um, I can understand all of that. You know, guns yeah. could need to be staged very, very, very specifically, and that. Is might not be something that's obvious to a uh, t- to an actor, but if someone hands you a gun and says "cold gun," there's nothing you can screw up on that gun. Open the chamber, look at all the chambers. If it's a you know if it's if if it's a revolver, uh, you know any sort of thing. There's there's nothing to stop you from do- doing that, and it just makes good sense. If there's not supposed to be anything in the gun, verify that there's nothing in the gun. Um, and, uh, and then, and then furthermore, the same, preca- like, I, I, I will say he, Alec Baldwin did never expected there to be an ounce of ammo in that gun. So the fact that he might've been behaving differently there is for an actor understandable, but for a gun owner, obviously we know that the first rule of gun safety, the gun is always loaded. It means that. You never, ever treat a firearm differently because it's unloaded. Because number one, you may, it may not be unloaded in the case of Alec Baldwin. And, uh, and then, you know, number, it's just number, number two is the same as number one. It's just, yeah. it may not. It, it's always it, loaded until you've confirmed it's not loaded. And if it ever leaves your control, it's loaded again. Yeah. And then. Even then, try to, pre- to pre- try to pretend, try to treat it like it's loaded, even after you've confirmed it's completely unloaded. You don't point at other people. You don't. Yep. Yeah. It's. It, yeah. It, so it, it's it's going to be interesting if anything happens over this. I mean, obviously he's been recharged, and so he's there's a, there's another trial set. Um, you know, we will, you know, we, we will see if it goes to full trial, if there's a plea deal and all that, obviously Hannah Reed is still awaiting, awaiting trial and there's her behavior and, 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 and the evidence that I've heard against her on the fact that there are multiple accidental discharges of firearms that shouldn't have discharged and the fact that they were target shooting off in the desert with live ammo and that the, the investigators discovered lots and lots of live ammo in various places where there should not have been live ammo. Yeah. Um, Which is how disappointed is her father and her right now? Oh God. Yeah. Thel Reed is 
possibly the greatest Hollywood armorer, you know, in the history right. of ever. And how many injuries occurred under his watch? There, I don't think there were any deaths because he wasn't on the crow. Yeah. He? No, he was not. Not that, yeah. I know, not that I know of. Yeah, I didn't think so. But I mean, but no, many- he, I, I, say, I, would, I would argue. No, I mean, he uh, I did see an interview or no, it was, it was Hannah Reed was mentioning that. Yeah, that uh, that her her father was the one that taught her to cross drill her hero rounds and put BBs inside them so that they would both be visibly, um, uh, you know, visibly demilled, but also have an audible sound associated with not working. Yeah. And so, uh, and so she and the- either didn't follow through on that or wasn't in control of it. Cause I mean, we've talked about already is she wasn't allowed in the church on the set. Mm-hmm. where this event where this shooting occurred so she might have done other irresponsible things but i don't see how she can be held responsible for that gun when she was never in control of it yeah especially especially since the if the if the ad was acting as the armor right you would assume again like all of us the I, I i talk about it we were we we were taking a tour of the the nra museum exhibit at one of the nra annual meetings and they had the um uh savage 45 that was used in the 1911 pistol trials oh. and and my the my friend was the first one to get it and the first thing he did was he pulled the action open and checked it and they went oh there's something i mean i don't there's I don't something know. wrong with this one we wish yeah. you hadn't done that exactly and and all that and he was just like what am i gonna do someone just handed me a firearm i'm gonna clear it and no nobody argued with it and no, they, no. everyone's like we understand that yeah. we just wish you hadn't yeah he hadn't gotten in any trouble it, it, they just they it was uh yeah it was just a uh the action had been so when when i when i got a chance to handle it the action was locked back and, because and they, was not going forward it was not going forward no so i i don't know what the story was with with that but uh but either way the it makes me wonder if our opinion of this would be different if instead of Alec Baldwin saying no i didn't pull the trigger i'm completely innocent it was look i was handed this gun by an armorer or ad or her, but but it was handed to me in good faith i was told that it was completely uh harmless and therefore there shouldn't have been any harm in pulling the trigger while i was shooting the scene i mean there is still some culpability there you know he should have double checked he shouldn't have had his finger on the trigger for practice whatever but yeah. if he instead of saying no i didn't do a thing it was like look i was told it was safe the, yeah. the 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 uh responsibility the negligence lies on the person who handed it to me and assured me that it was safe you know, I I think we would be interpreting a lot of this differently. I, I mean, I, I, I would, would certainly be a lot more charitable. Exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I agree with that to, to to some extent, and I I will always say that you know, despite my distaste for Alec Baldwin and his his love of gun control, uh, and just Our dislike for him as a person. Yeah, just I mean, he's he's a jerk. He's generally a jerk. He's one he's one of those actors. Mm-hmm. And again, I will also say I am I am someone who had made a choice of the I, I, either I can be in love with movies and like to watch them and and talk about them, or I can be someone who is a, a moral absolutist and will and will avoid uh, things that are are essentially putting money in the pockets of terrible people and uh we, we've already talked of my love of roman polanski movies so that should say a lot about it because there are a few people more terrible than roman polanski um but uh in the in the case of alec baldwin i've never once said that he should ha- have uh the case of murder or any of the you know intentional death situations this is very clearly an accident and has always been an accident there's certainly a lot of distaste for the fact that he's saying i didn't pull the trigger despite the fact that he's on camera putting his damn finger on the trigger 
um, and uh, you know, saying that it was the gun's fault. But, Anything but him. But also, now granted, I don't know who's behind the camera in this scene in the video that I posted, but uh, but he certainly seems comfortable enough, and he's certainly an arrogant enough guy that he's not beyond telling other people what to do that. Why would he, and certainly he was, you could hear him saying the name Helena, you know, in, in, in these scenes. So he's certainly, certainly not being passive and, and, and being totally submissive to the director uh, when he's, uh, when he's, when he's in costume. So the fact that he, he knows you're not supposed to be pointing guns at people during scenes. You're not supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to be using force perspective and blanks and, and CGI effects and other things. So that at no point is the gun actually pointed at a living human being. And he pointed at literally two people and pulled the trigger. At at least two people were swept by that muzzle. Correct. Two of them happened to be in the path of it when it when it discharged. Yeah, but yeah, that's mm, all right. A lot, of, lot of no bueno. All right, this uh, this this next one was put in by Oddball, and he put it in well, <laughs> during the during during the pre-show phase of the show, and so we all noted that yeah, we don't have time time to watch this. So, uh, Oddball, what are ain't, we looking at here? Ain't nobody got time for that. So, uh, the ATF, which I mean. I believe everybody is familiar with the quote unquote solvent traps Mm -hmm. that are on the market that are absolutely for collecting the solvent that you pour down a barrel. And they're not ATF honey traps. I I mean, cause, cause David, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're they're solvent traps, not honey traps. (laughs) Who'd put honey down a barrel? Right. I mean, David, I'm 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 sure you absolutely reuse the solvent that you use when when cleaning your firearms, right? Sure. And and, and you absolutely have a solvent trap that has baffles in it so that the solvent is properly cooled as you collect it. Well, it's to keep it from splashing, isn't or it? Sorted or is it? D- wait, is it baffles or is it? Like window screening to help filter out the chunks. <laughs> uh, I mean, mo- most of the ones that I've seen have have the, the little cups. Um, and, and similarly, I have seen people sell "quote unquote" survival kits that were tube shaped and had separate compartments that were. Now, I I have seen that kind of thing, but also I've seen the. Uh, the old O um, three Springfield and M one Garand cleaning kits, which on the outside they look like a slightly oversized cigar tube, and there are oh, screw yeah. caps on both ends. But yeah. there's a divider in the middle. They're not possibly right. And, and but I, I, the the these quote survival kits had uh huh conical inserts that that would separate the different chambers that you'd have to remove to get to the next chamber um well the atf has declared that uh beyond the whole shenanigans of them now basically making it impossible to form one a suppressor um that those solvent traps just buying or possessing one is now a felony. Uh, be- I will. Let me just uh, one more thing about the adapter, the solvent trap adapter. There mm-hmm. are several different types. One of them was threaded the same as a plastic bottle cap, and yeah. they were advertised as you would put this on the muzzle, you would screw on the plastic bottle cap bottle rather, and then when you push the patch through the bore, it would fall off and get caught by the bottle. That was yeah. how it was sold. Yeah, the, Any, the, anything else would be a misuse of the product. Yeah, wink, wink. And, and these are these are not what we were talking about, and that that is absolutely a very very interesting design. Again, you essentially thread this thing onto your muzzle, and then thread on a two liter soda bottle or a one liter soda bottle onto the on, onto the adapter, 
yeah and then you spray your your lube your, your solvent down into the uh it, it, you know into your rifling and uh and and then run your uh run run your patches down and so all that mess that drips out of the muzzle end of the uh of the gun is instead going into this two liter bottle and then your patches are dropping down into there and so the idea is that you fill it up with patches and then you can just put the bottle cap onto the bottle once it's full or close to full and even not you use a, you use one of the small water bottles like the 16.9 right. and that's one gun off it goes mm-hmm. yeah. but here's another theory that was raised is you take that same unit and you take that whatever size bottle and you stuff that bottle full of polyfill pulled mm-hmm. out of a pillow mm-hmm. then you put it on and then you fire around through it that's yeah. misuse of the product but it will especially with uh, certain calibers and velocities it will muffle that shot right and, and if uh and if somehow you have uh you are listening to this and you are unaware of these solvent traps that that i speak of um they are very, very clearly um suppressors minus the yeah, if you have a drill bit, just just drill here and, and uh, of the uh, correct diameter, and you you've got a suppressor. Um, these I uh, myself and and I believe that the rest of the folks here have pretty much always looked at these as as was said previously. Uh, is is this an ATF honey trap? Is, what 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 are you doing here? Yep. Um. But the ATF has come out and said just possessing that is enough to say that no, that that's a suppressor. They're bas- they're basically doing the same thing to suppressors as uh, they have tried to do with uh, frames and receivers. With the yeah, if, if it's easily and quickly uh, converted into a functioning suppressor, you, you've you've got a suppressor. Um, and of course, the letter that they recently put out also uh, reminds everybody that their current stance is any part of a suppressor is a suppressor as far as the law is concerned. Um, so if you have, you know, that that adapter nut on the end, that's. You know that is enough to get you in trouble. Having one of those baffles is enough to get you in trouble, even if yeah. you don't have any of the rest of it. Um, yeah, that's that shows. Const- is that constructive intent falls under? Uh, they're they're actually just saying, as far as what they're reading in the law, that is just straight up possession because they're they're saying that uh, uh, apparently the law actually specified. Uh, they're they're claiming that the law actually specifies that uh it includes uh parts uh, of the suppressor they're oh. they're 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 not they're not even trying to go the route of constructive possession so this is a, a another chevron deference thing um since they're interpreting i honestly with 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 what i i i briefly saw the the letter and i haven't uh looked at the law that they're referring to so oh, i'd ha- i'd have to uh the the letter seems to make it sound like the law actually straight up says uh a, a full suppressor or parts of a suppressor um are is, is good enough but but i'd have to look at the actual law um and it's one of those things of the okay everybody knows if you're if you're buying a, a solvent the the quote unquote solvent trap Everybody knows what you're doing, right? Uh, but it, it, it's it's not the thing yet. So you know, I, on, on one hand, I I won't feel too bad about people that that bought the stupid thing and 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 get caught do, doing the stupid. But on the other hand, it, it it doesn't sit real well with me. And on the third hand, the Hearing Protection Act should have been passed under the Trump oh, administration. God, yes. Hell God, yeah. yes. Like I mean, a, suppre- suppressor should be completely unregulated. Um, all right. Well, let's. We're we're we got one left. The, uh, the last thing I toss on there is in relation to the uh, the ATF solvent trap. 
because a comment was was made in the chat earlier uh, by uh, was it Matthew or Heinrich from Geeks Gadgets and Guns mm-hmm. that I'm tempted to submit a form one and for parts provide a link to McMaster Car. So I provided a link to McMaster Car in the show notes because if you're going to make a firearm and you're not actually going to be purchasing firearm parts, McMaster car is your go-to. Oh, there. All right. Well, on that note, let's, uh, (laughs) let's, let's get out. We've been, we've been at this for a while and, uh, I don't even uh, remember where we started. Yes. So, well, I logged uh, in at nine o'clock and it's after midnight. So uh, oddball is that the correct time? I thought it was closer to 10, but either way, I mean, after midnight's a song. (laughs) All right. I'm thanking our listeners. Thanks to each and every one of our listeners, but a very special thanks to all our supporters on Patreon. To our Patreon patron, go to patreon.com. So sorry, Calibers podcast to sign up. Patrons get an early release of the podcast, plus bonus content, hilarious blooper reels, the ACP film tracks, and the ACP mag dump. And of course, we were just talking a lot about movies. Trust me, you want to, you want to check out the film tracks. They're a lot of fun. Also, please remember to rate us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe to us on the platform of your choice, and share the show with your friends both online and off. I got a blog. It's called weirdworld.com, and you can hear me weekly on Handgun Radio on the Firearms Radio Network. I got a link tree. You know where to find me. Next. Uh, I, am, uh, I am often on Handgun Radio. I have a blog at gunscarstack.com. I can be found hanging around at the uh, ACP Facebook group, and... My wife has a podcast called Meow Core. Check it out. David. I'm here. I'm on Handgun Radio when they're not recording at Odark 30 in the morning. Uh, regular contributor to Blue Collar Prepping. Uh, published author books under Brenna Bach and David Bach on Amazon. And I am not adopting two more cats. Yes, you are. <laughs> well, that's good because you just adopted two more cats. I, there are three cats. Two John The number of cats in our podcast is assorted, and so is our podcast. Good night, everyone. (laughs) Good night. (laughs) Chef's kiss, Aaron. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm.